Art Buildings Academy podcast with Phil Zito, episode 344. Hey folks, Phil Zito here, and welcome to episode 344 of the Smart Buildings Academy podcast. In this episode, we are going to be talking about programming. Specifically, we're going to be talking about design patterns. So what you will see in this episode is we're going to start off by just kind of discussing what design patterns are and a design pattern approach to programming. It's probably different than some of the things you've seen in the past. Then we are going to go and give a couple of example design patterns. As always, everything can be found at podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 344. Once again, that's podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 344. And I do want to remind you that on July 18th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern, we will be going through our workforce development open house. So if you're struggling to find people and develop people for your building automation business, or you're trying to get started in building automation, then I encourage you to check out this free live webinar. All right, let's dive in. So maybe you've heard of the concept design patterns in the past. Maybe you've not. But my experience with people learning to program has often been, hey, go memorize blocks look at existing pro programs, try to figure out how these programs are working, tweak and edit the programs and hope they still work, and eventually it'll just click. And that's essentially what you're taught. If you go to most training programs, they're going to give you the pretty much same example every time. It's going to be, you know, you've got a boiler, two pumps, maybe it's a chiller with two pumps, an air handler with a fan and a cooling valve and heating valve and a damper. And you've got to write this program. And it's usually literally follow the steps, follow the exact examples. And folks leave not really understanding how to program. They understand the tool. They understand kind of the logic blocks and they understand where to find the logic blocks. Outside of that, they don't really understand the programming. So how do we get to a point where people can understand intuitively how to program? If you look at anything in life, it is almost always pattern driven. If you think about how you do something, whether it's building a house, whether it's building a bench, whether it's sewing you know, a costume for your kids, whatever it is, there are patterns. And if you're able to identify these patterns, then you're able to learn to easily, in this case, program. In those cases, you know, build a bench, build a house, make a costume, whatever. So how do we develop patterns for our programming? The first thing, obviously, is we have to have an understanding of HVAC. If you want to be able to, for example, take an analog enable pattern, which is the first pattern we'll look at on my screen in just a second, then you need to understand why you would use an analog enable pattern. So the first thing we want to talk about here is, you know, what's an example of a pattern? And we're going to talk about the analog enable pattern. So the analog enable pattern you use all the time in building automation. And the analog enable pattern is, you know, if outside air goes greater than then X enable the chiller. If outside air is less than X, enable the economizer. If outside air is less than X, enable the boiler. These are very common patterns. We see them in almost all sequence logic. So how do we do that pattern? Well, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Let me see, show and stream. Okay, there we go. I don't know if we just lost audio for a second. I'm still uh, learning this software. So, cause it was saying users can't see you, can't hear you. Uh, so if you couldn't hear me just then, basically what I said was 
hey, we're going to go go and demonstrate this pattern on this software right here. And this pattern is going to be the enable pattern. So let's dive in. Uh, if you see me kind of looking off to the left, it's because I got an ultra wide monitor. And uh, so I got to find where this stuff's at. All right, let's go to logic. Let me grab this greater than block. I'm going to kind of drag it up here. I'm going to create two numeric writables. One I'm going to call the process variable of OAT. And the other is going to be a numeric writable. And I'm going to call this OAT enable set point. Can you tell I used to work at Johnson Controls? Um, I go and I, I use their naming schemes typically. All right, so I would go outside air temp. And we're just going to give this guy a value. I'm going to just set him for simplicity, say here to 80. And I'm going to give my enable set point here. I'm going to go and make this bad boy 65. Okay. We're going to put it in here. And we can see I am getting a Boolean true coming out of my output, right? So I've got a outdoor air temp. This is an analog. I've got my set point. This is an analog. And this thus enables me to be able to go and enable all sorts of logic. So this would look like something like uh, when outside air is greater than X, enable economizer. When outside air is greater than X, enable chilled water plant. And so now what you're seeing is the ability to use this pattern across the board. But it's more than just that. You can do um, maybe trim and response, right? So we have a trim and response sequence, which we'll talk about guideline 36 on Friday. But uh, with a trim and response sequence, we're going to be sitting there and we're going to go. And let me just verify that you all are seeing my screen. I just want to double check here because, like I said, I'm still getting used to this. Okay, cool, cool, cool. You all are seeing it. Good to go. All right. So as I mentioned... Uh, with trim and response, you will go and look for calls for cooling or calls for heating. And when they exceed a certain amount of infer or a certain point over a time period, you will then gradually go and maybe increase pressure um, or decrease pressure set point. Or maybe you'll go and you would go and say, hey, I'm going to uh, increase or decrease temperature. Which brings us to our ne next design pattern which is going to be called the reset pattern. Now we've seen reset patterns all over the place. Let me find this, like I said, this is very, very small and I have bad eyes, so we're gonna do this. All right, so the reset pattern, let me pin a couple slots here so we can see them, boom, 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 and we're good to go. All right, so the reset pattern is another pattern that we use all the time. And when outside air temp is 30, we discharge 180 degrees on our hot water set point. When outside air is 60, our hot water set point for our secondary loop maybe is 140 degrees. And this is an example of a reset. The reset pattern is an additional pattern that is quite easy to do. So I can take my outside air temp here and I'll have it come in here to my input. And then I can do a hard set pattern where I actually program them into the block, or I can do an adjustable pattern where I would add variables and I would then go and map these variables in here. For simplicity's sake, we're just gonna do a hard set pattern, right? And so this is gonna be a reverse acting loop, or sorry, reverse acting reset. So I'm gonna put that guy in there, 30. I'm gonna do this guy, 65. And now I'm going to do this guy 180. And I'm going to do this guy right here 180. And this will be 140. And what we should see, if I remember correctly, is a reset outside right there. Yep. So I'm going to go back here, zoom in once again, and we see our reset taking effect. We have an 80 degree outside air. I mean, granted, the hot water system probably shouldn't be on at 80, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, we could see our reset pattern taking effect. And this is going to handle a ton 
of different logic situations. Chilled water reset, hot water reset, pressure reset based off of maybe average zone damper position. Uh, you could also do chilled water reset off of the average valve position. So we could go literally and add a averaging block here. And this averaging block could sample from multiple valve positions and then quite simply be the input to my reset. And that's how we can do an average base reset. But what I hope you're seeing here is that this logic, it's all pattern based. And we're going super high level here. You know, in our programming course, we go across 28 patterns and we're only going to cover three patterns today. But I wanted you all to see that. So I did the reset. I did the analog enable pattern. And now we're going to look at the high select pattern. A lot of you listened in on my DCV podcast. Uh, I believe it was this Monday where we talked about demand ventilation or demand control ventilation. I think it was that. It may have been last Friday. I, the days all blend together. But demand control ventilation, right? If I go here to HVAC, I grab a loop point object. So my loop point is, I'm just going to pin my set point, my control variable, also known as process variable, and we should be good to go. So what I'm going to do, this is a PID loop, right? And my PID loop can have, with a, um, with demand control ventilation, I can actually do two PID loops. One will drive to mixed air temp, and that's going to be our economizer. And the other is going to drive to CO2. So let's build out this pattern real quick. We're going to put a uh, ZN CO2. Okay, I'm going to put that, and that is going to be my control variable or process variable. I'm going to create a CO2 set point. Okay, and uh, I'm just going to give this a static value of 800. I'm going to have it go in here to my set point, right? And I got to enable the loop and do a bunch of stuff, but we'll see it in just a second. It'll, it'll all make sense. I'm going to go here. Oh, I forgot to open chat. My bad. Sorry, folks. Uh, chat should be open now. All right, cool. Uh, numeric right here. I'm going to make this MAT for my control variable, mixed air temp. Sometimes you drive the discharge air temp on uh, economizer control, sometimes mixed air temp. And uh, we're going to make this uh, mixed air temp SP set point. Okay, so we'll do that. I'm going to go set point. I'm going to set set point to 55. I'm going to set mixed air temp. Let's set this to 60. Let's set it to 60. I'm going to, okay, I got direct acting, proportional constant. Uh, so that's 10 divided by 100 should be 10. Uh, and then integral constant should be 0.1. That should give us a decent acting loop. Okay. There we go. All right, perfect. I'm going to actually disable this loop real quickly just so it doesn't go and drive itself crazy right now. So I'll just hit save on this bad boy. We'll go back. And I'm going to go here on this point. And for those of you who are listening uh, and not watching, for one, go to podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 344. And you'll be able to see the video recording. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm creating a high select pattern because with CO2 control and mixed air economizer control, my primary concern in this case is CO2 control for indoor air quality for the occupants so that we're managing expectations of ASHRAE 62.1. And in order to do that, I need to have CO2 controlling the damper and I need to take a high select so that if my CO2 is higher um, than the set point 
and that damper starts to open up and it's not being satisfied, it will take that damper command if it's higher than the economizer command. Now there's a lot of other stuff you need to put in here like low limit logic and fan enable status logic and whatever, but the pattern remains true, right? Two PID loops and a high select. All right, so we got our set point here, um, Z CO2, uh, we'll set this to 1,000. Okay, and then uh, I'm gonna go in here real quickly and uh, my range, my control range, uh, probably be like 400 to 1400, so most likely like 1,000. Um, 100 divided by 1,000, that should be, do, 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 uh, 1,000 divided by, or no, 100 divided by 1,000 should give me a proportional constant. Oh my gosh, I can't do math on the fly. Holy crap. That's so, so bad. All right. 100 divided by 1,000. 0.1. All right. 0.1. Integral constant should be 1. If I did my math on the fly right, then, yep, we're going to gradually see my very, very slow loop increase. Give me one second. I'm going to take a sip of some liquid. All right. So then what I need to do here is I'm going to go to math and I'm going to take a maximum. All right. And uh, we'll have input A. And we'll have input B. Oh, minimum. But yeah, no, maximum. I was right. Right, right, right. Uh, so this is going to be my high select, right? I'm going to actually enable this loop real quickly. And we're going to enable this bad boy. It's going to go true, save, go back. And now what this is going to do, let me zoom in. We're going to see the high select working because mixed air temp, right, is much more aggressive. There's much more of an error, which error is the delta the difference between control variable and set point, because there's a much greater error, we are going to see this loop, which is also a faster loop because it's got a smaller prop band, is going to go and actually do this much quicker. It's going to totalize up much quicker. But if I were to go and actually drop this bad boy down to 50, I'm going to shed all of my proportional and my integral pretty quickly. And now we're going to see that the maximum of the CO2 is going up. And the nice thing about this is you can use this pattern if you ever had a minimum damper position. You use your point, you use your maximum, and you have your minimum damper position as a variable, an adjustable variable, going into the maximum block. So you can see this there as well. And this enables you to be able to go and do a lot of different logic. Now, I know this seems pretty simplistic, and it should seem simplistic. And my challenge to you as a programmer or as a building automation technician or as someone who's teaching BAS tech technicians to program is to try to find the patterns in the HVAC logic. You know, there is not really anything new under the sun with HVAC. Even with guideline 36, a lot of what is recommended there outside of the analytics aspect of it is pretty much logic that we've been implementing for a long time. We just haven't been doing it on scale due to the um, data consumption requirements of, you know, turbine response and sampling all these boxes and valves and stuff like that. But what I hope you've seen in today's podcast is the ability to identify three common HVAC patterns, the, the uh, high select, the analog enable, and write our reset patterns. And you understand where that HVAC sequence ties to that logic. And now if you there's really about 20, 25 patterns. And if you go and you build out those 20, 25 patterns, then what that's going to enable you to do, right? You'll have those patterns and then you'll have that corresponding to the logic 
And then all you really have to do when you read a sequence to write a program is go through the sequence, look for the logic snippets that the design patterns that match up to those HVAC sequences and build those patterns in your program, piece the patterns together, and then you've written a program. This makes programming much easier. It makes it much more intuitive to people who are learning programming. So I'll pause real quick, see if we've got any questions. I'll go check a couple areas, see if any questions come through. Uh, I'm not seeing any coming through. But uh, yeah, I'll check on YouTube as well, see if any questions came through there. Let me check. And uh, if I don't see any questions, okay, which I'm not, so that's cool. Uh, let's go and wrap this bad boy up. All right, so in summary, a lot of people learn programming by going to a class, to a products class, and they learn how to use the tool, they learn how to memorize the different types of logic blocks, but what they're not taught is how to translate an HVAC sequence into programming logic. So it is quite easy, but it is a different way of thinking. If you think about building out a roof truss, or if you think about framing up a house, or if you think about laying out a panel, all of those have patterns to how you do it. You don't reinvent the wheel every time or just throw a bunch of stuff in the panel and hope it works. There's logic to it, like putting transformers on the top, like putting your contacts on the bottom. There's a variety of logical ways that you do these things. The same is true with programming. We look at the HVAC sequence. We identify patterns, things that happen again and again. Like I said, high and low selects, lead lag patterns, things like enable patterns, analog or Boolean enable patterns. And once we identify those patterns and we're able to build out that programming based on those patterns, then we are able to go and quickly write programs that work and it makes it much easier. So next time you're trying to teach a tech or maybe you yourself are trying to write a program, I encourage you to consider this approach to look at the sequence, consider what is the pattern here and what are the corresponding blocks that would enable me to do that pattern uh, uh, and or line code. We're just doing block because most people do block programming. And with that being said, as always, everything will be available at podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 344. Once again, that is podcast.smartbuildingsacademy.com forward slash 344. I encourage you to go there. This video recording will be there for you to watch. As well, there will be links to our uh, free programming mini course, as well as to our paid programming course for you to check out. Thanks a ton. Uh, please like, subscribe, and comment. It helps share this podcast and webcast with others who may be interested in learning this information. And if you have any suggestions or ideas on things we can do to improve these podcast episodes, uh, definitely just let us know. We're always open to feedback, always open to improvement. I hope this has been valuable for you, and I will see you on Friday where we'll be going through guideline 36. I'm pretty experienced with it. Um, that being said, I'm far from an expert with it. And I think we can benefit by going through guideline 36 and brushing up on it together. And I think that'll be really beneficial because we'll learn uh, some guideline 36 stuff together, uh, maybe discover some stuff we didn't know and uh, get a different look at it since it's becoming very popular with the price of energy increasing right now. All right, folks, love seeing you all here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, share this with your friends, share this with your coworkers, and I appreciate it. Thanks for letting me do this. And I look forward to talking to you all on Friday. Thanks so much and take care.